Hey everyone, it's me again. I hope yesterday was a success for you with all six of your classes. I was pleased with your responses on the Google chat, so thanks for that. Um, so today starts the first of the 90-minute uh, classes, so uh, we'll kind of continue at pace here. Um, in order to kind of make this a little more manageable, what I've done is I've separated this topic into two kind of smaller PowerPoints. So you can start with this one, then there'll be a little time for a Google chat uh, so we can try to replicate the interactiveness and things like that. And then we'll do another one and then that will lead into uh, just a small assignment on Google Classroom. And then especially after today, I'm curious for your feedback uh, what's working well, what's not working, tips, suggestions. This class obviously is my primary focus, but anything else you may have, I'm also interested in hearing from you. Um, again, for the foreseeable future, this is the way we are going to operate. So I want to make sure that we're on the right path with everything. Anyways, let's begin and let's go through the Roaring Twenties. So we started this yesterday, just a little bit of an intro. We talked about uh, the first Red Scare. We talked about the rise of nativism. We talked about anti-immigration and things like that. So today what I'd like to do is tell you about some other things going on in the Roaring Twenties. And then we'll move ourselves into uh, political rule and government in the 1920s. So we'll start here with um, probably the most failed experiment in U.S. history, which is prohibition. So anyways, um, if you recall, there's been these little temperance movements that have been flaring up throughout the United States. And finally, in the late 1910s, 1919, um, the temperance movement in the United States will hit its ultimate success with the passage of the 18th Amendment. This is prohibition. So the total end to the sale, consumption um, of alcohol in the United States. In order to enforce it, a separate act was passed called the Volstead Act. This is one of those kind of key terms for you to recall. And for many big temperance people, as well as for many progressives, this was kind of the ultimate victory. Um, for many, alcohol was kind of the ultimate social evil. Prohibition will hit some uh, popularity in the South, probably not for great reasons. Uh, whites in the South like Prohibition because it prohibited blacks basically from being able to drink alcohol, so that explains why they thought it was good. Um, and then the other area in which Prohibition is going to be relatively popular will be in the West. Um, if you recall, the West had the saloons and kind of the lawlessness and prostitution, gambling, and so for many, getting alcohol was kind of the root of all those problems, so getting rid of it is seen as being good. So a lot of momentum when this first came out. Um, with that being said, at the end of the day, prohibition was probably one of the dumbest things that has been done by the government, or I guess the government attempting to do, and there's a couple reasons for that. The first is that the United States, for better or for worse, has a large tradition of alcohol drinking as part of our culture. And this kind of exists, obviously, still today. But even going back to colonial times, it was the taverns and pubs and bars where people congregated and people discussed various topics and issues. Immigrants coming into the United States also brought with themselves their, you know, heavy drinking kind of patterns. So, um, that kind of American tradition of drinking strong and something that would not go away easily, especially when we talk about um, Eastern cities. The other thing that you want to realize, and you're kind of seeing this right now as the government places more restrictions on people in order to try to kind of fight the uh, COVID-19, is that the American people as a whole are really, really disfavorable towards government 
uh, regulation. And so that's just something that's been a part of American identity for a long time, the idea that Americans don't want these higher kind of orders coming from the government. So with that being the case, there are many that are going to totally violate prohibition and not think much of it. Um, in order to still drink, even though it will be prohibited by law, bootlegging will become extremely popular as people will go ahead and uh, bypass federal and local authorities. Weak enforcement also is going to accompany prohibition as um, we'll, we'll kind of see this. I, I don't want to spend too much time with this, but um, gangsters will go ahead and they will uh, basically pay off federal state authorities um, in order to kind of turn a blind eye. So that will be kind of the way this works. And people will still continue to drink pretty easily during prohibition. Uh, speakeasies will emerge, which are so named because to get in, you had to have a secret code and then they would open the door for you. Um, but again, people will largely continue to drink if they so want uh, during the prohibition period. So that's kind of the truth behind this. Prohibition and its ultimate failure can be seen in the 21st Amendment passed in 1933, where they just kind of got rid of prohibition. So uh, that's really the only amendment that we have that literally replaced a previous amendment, if you can kind of think about that. So again, um, about 14 years of the prohibition period, but really one that uh, did not work out very well. If you see here in this image, this happened right after the passage where uh, bars, distilleries, breweries were forced to uh, get rid of their entire product. These are people protesting against prohibition. Here are um, some of our bootleggers and some of our disguised deliveries coming in. And so this was done to um, evade authorities. But again, you want to realize that it was uh, uh, the other thing that happened was um, authorities were oftentimes paid off in order to kind of turn a blind eye. These really are speakeasies. Um, again, they're pretty full with people. So showing once again that people that did want to drink during Prohibition largely did and kind of went uninterrupted. Another look here. And this, by the way, uh, was in 1933 with the passage of the 21st Amendment. Again, bidding farewell to the 18th Amendment. And I just want to include this. This is the most notorious 1920s gangster. Uh, maybe the most notorious American gangster of all, all time, Al Capone, um, whose business was definitely bootlegging alcohol. He did other things as well. Uh, but... You know, he was largely able to run a massive empire because of the wealth he was able to accumulate and his ability to uh, pay off local and state authorities. There's also going to be a pretty famous trial that occurs here um, in the 1920s uh, that is an important trial within and of itself, but also is going to pinpoint some of the divide going on in society in the 1920s and that's the scopes trial uh before we get into that it is worth to note that in the 1920s more states are going to require mandatory education uh for young people to 16 to 18 years old so this is what you're used to today in the united states but that's going to become more and more of a requirement there's also going to be pretty big strides made in many fields, but one of them that I thought I'd note here is science. If you remember, in the later kind of 1800s, we had Darwin come up with this theory of evolution, very hotly debated. Originally, a lot of people kind of hesitant, but as we kind of head into the 20th century, more research will be done, more kind of leading minds coming together and saying, this makes sense and this seems to be correct. So with that being said, Darwin and evolution will become more and more well taught throughout the country. Um, at the same time, though, we're going to see a rise in fundamentalism in the South. 
And fundamentalism still exists today, but these are people that are devoutly religious, believe that religion is literally the fundamental of all of society. They believe in literal translation of the Bible. Um, you know, no exceptions for really anything. And they are going to feel strongly that Darwin and his theory of evolution cannot and should not be taught in the schools. And again, in other parts of the country other than the South, they won't have much um, of a stand or much authority, but in 1920 South, uh, the fundamentalists will be relatively strong. In order to pinpoint this divide between science and religion and fundamentalism versus uh, Darwin, uh, a teacher from the state of Tennessee, John Scopes, will go on trial because he taught um, evolution. Actually, and and I'm going to show you this, and you kind of see this here, this trial will attract a lot of attention and a lot of people in the um in the town are going to show up. It's going to be a packed courtroom. Uh, the attorneys are going to be like pretty famous national attorneys. Actually, kind of interesting. William Jennings Bryan, if you remember the guy that ran for president all those times and lost, will actually go down to Tennessee to help defend John Scopes. And he did not do a very good job for whatever it's worth. Actually, he died. Um, only a few days after the trial, um, you know, well, okay, whatever. But anyways, point of the story, Scopes will be found guilty for teaching evolution and will be fined. Um, what you kind of want to take out of this is number one, there's going to be a lot of divide of society throughout the 1920s. Um, so for example, with like prohibition, there's the dries the people that advocated for prohibition and the wets, the people that advocated for the end to uh, the end of prohibition. There's going to be divide between people that, you know, city, urban, and all that kind of stuff. And this is one of these other examples of a divide between religion and science. And this is something that is not really going to go away, especially in more conservative parts of the country in the South. And, you know, even today, this is a big divide and something that um, happens. But anyways, uh, really on the national forefront, people paying attention in the 1920s with the uh, Scopes trial. Economically, the country is really going to transform in the 1920s. And I want to kind of explain some of these major transformations that are going to take place because this is really going to help fuel and help explain some of what's going to happen when we start talking next week about uh, the stock market crash and the Great Depression and what kind of occurs there. So anyways, the 1920s and early uh, 1900s, is a time of new invention. This includes things like refrigeration, uh, more advances with uh, telephones and, and things like that. And obviously you see it here, the biggest invention of the 1920s is going to be the automobile. Now the automobile actually is invented in the late 1800s, but by the 1920s, it's going to start to become something that most Americans are going to have, basically a car. And so not only is the invention itself significant, the other thing that you want to take away from it is how it's going to help kind of develop this new car culture in the United States and all these things that people are now going to do with their cars. You know, kind of completely transform the way people think. It's also going to uh, draw to attention a northern city, Detroit, as Detroit becomes the automobile capital of the world. And again, really kind of changing the dynamics, more people are going to move to Detroit to work in uh, the automobile factories. And one of the big reasons why is because the automobile, um, the technology used is the assembly line. And this allows for mass production of automobiles to take place. It also makes the price of automobiles relatively cheap. So the amount of Americans who will own a car in the 1920s will be more than any other country. So it is worthy of a note that the car 
when it was originally invented, was really only for rich people. But now there's going to be, you know, models that serve for people that are kind of like average Americans. So it's really significant to kind of consider. And other industries and other places will use the assembly line and use mass production as well. What we're also going to see in the 1920s is high levels of consumerism as Americans become basically obsessed with buying products. And sometimes these are products that people don't necessarily need. But because of new inventions and because of things like that, advances in production, advances in industry, these objects and items are available. In order to help solve that problem of trying to kind of shift Americans' viewpoints into needing a specific item, the advertising industry in the United States will grow to epic proportions. And we'll see billboards, posters, uh, not we're not quite on television yet, but like radio ads and other things like that in order to convince Americans of a product they need to buy. The other thing that's going to happen is that although we will see during the 1920s wages for the average American rise and things like that, you know, still you got to buy things. You got to spend money. So companies are going to do something which is going to become relatively popular in the 1920s which is buying through credit. Now again, credit buying still exists today. It's why so many people have a credit card. But this is the idea that you pay little to no money right away, and then you pay for your product over time. And this, by the way, is going to become extremely popular as more and more Americans uh, will buy goods based on credit. Now again, I'm not saying buying things on credit is the worst thing ever, but what I will say is it's dangerous. And it's going to become one of those things where these factors kind of coming together, these high levels of consumerism, the effectiveness of advertising, and the use of credit is going to turn into something where Americans are going to be buying goods that they don't necessarily have the money to buy um, for. But again, because they're putting so much, they're putting so little down and they're paying and buying over time, it's not going to make much of a difference. So that's something really kind of significant I do want to share out of this uh, because, again, it will really transform the way society operates. I want to show you some examples of advertisements and other kind of things from the 1920s. We see here a Ford uh, car catalog, and you can see here variations of price and, again, kind of symbolizing the idea that you had kind of more base models that was more for the average American and then you had some of your higher end models that were for you know people that making a little bit more money here's another thing by the way and you can see just how dramatic um cars and things like that car sales by the way 1910 39,000 um, and then 1924, over 580,000 cars sold. And then you can see here the amount of credit granted, $810 million um, from 1919 to 1925. So it's a huge amount of money that uh, car companies are going to allow here. This is General Motors specifically, so people can buy the cars now, pay later. And again, this is dangerous because if you're not careful, this means that you're buying things that you can't necessarily pay back over time. And that's absolutely going to happen out of this. Here's a advertisement from Firestone Tires. And I like this because it really kind of epitomizes what buying on credit is all about. Buy today, pay later, select what you need, arrange convenient terms, enjoy immediate delivery. And again, this is going to become common for really so many items. So cars, you see here tires. Um, but really, any appliance, you know, that's what's going to happen there. Here's a 1920s uh, book about um, education and things like that. And again, you're seeing some of the, um, you know, advertising tools being used, you know, very quick here. This is how you're going to get success, only 15 minutes a day. You, these things seem familiar to you even now. Coca-Cola, uh, okay, great. Here, by the way, is a uh, 
vacuum cleaner and again you can see here four dollars down four dollars a month um savings and again you see a lot of words here and stuff like that but that's what's going to be done in order to sell these items and again even something like a vacuum going to be bought on credit here by the way sears department store nice uh little advertisement as well I really like this one a lot Wash away the fat. This is special Lamar reducing soap. And look what it's saying here. If you use this special soap, uh, you're going to go and you're going to lose weight. Again, insane. Um, if you look at this carefully, it talks about how it's going to get rid of your double chin, all the rest of these things. Obviously a total scam, but at the same time, people will buy this in the hopes of being like this. And again, this is a good example of good 1920s advertising. The other thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit in the, kind of the next lesson, is that we really will not have much government regulation of big businesses throughout the 1920s. So there's not going to be like big oversight over false advertising or false claims. So even today, this kind of exists, but companies are largely forbidden from being able to make false claims um, when they advertise, but in the 1920s, with advertisement being so new and really kind of a lack of government regulation, we won't see that much of that, to be honest. Another place where we're going to see um, a lot of kind of interest in things like that uh, from like kind of typical Americans is going to be on the stock market with Wall Street. So, um, I'm going to break this down, and I, I, I kind of want to explain a little bit how the stock market works just very, very simply. Um, and then next week when we talk about the stock market crash, we'll kind of get into more detail on this. Um, anyway, some of our 1920s traders. Um, for as good as the economy is going to be looking in the 1920s, uh, there will still be some signs, basically, that not all is good. Uh, banks will still fail throughout the United States. Again, these are like smaller banks, but that is still going to happen throughout the 1920s, so it's not all picture perfect. And then another thing, again, that's going to kind of grip American consumers, especially uh, with the growth of big business, is going to be the stock exchange. And basically, the way the stock exchange works is if you're a company and you're big enough, you're able to be traded on the stock exchange and people can buy stock in the hopes that the company does well, they gain money back, you know, maybe you even have stocks, parents have stocks. We've kind of talked about this just a little bit. Here's what's big. In the 1920s, we have what's called a bull market. This is an expression used when basically the stock market for the most part is increasing. And throughout the 1920s, that's absolutely what's going to be happening. Another thing that you need to realize, and this still exists today, but especially is the case in the 1920s, the stock market is largely based upon speculation. So basically what that means is that really the value of stock is oftentimes determined by what people think or how people think the company is going to do. So there's not really an exact science behind it. But in the 1920s, people feel pretty confident, and that's what's going to be driving this. But as soon as public confidence is going to go away, the value of stocks is going to incredibly decrease. Another thing that we're going to see is that a lot of Americans are going to buy stocks on margin, which means they're going to be buying stocks essentially on credit. So this is also not good because you have people investing, but they're not necessarily putting money down right away. So this is another kind of problematic thing that's going to help explain why things will shake so badly in the 1920s. What we're going to see is a lot of kind of wild boom and bust of the stock market throughout the 1920s. Um, what's going to kind of happen here is that, and what we're going to see is that people will coordinate basically the values of the stocks. And so what's going to happen is a group of investors, they'll, they'll invest in a certain company when the value is low. And when they do that, the value is going to shoot up as, as again, based on speculation, people think there's huge, huge value, you know, in a certain stock. And then all of a sudden when all the people buy it, then they're going to sell it. And then all of a sudden the value of the stock is going to really kind of plummet. So this is, again, 
if you're paying attention to the news right now, this is something that's happening right now. It's not really booming. It's it's mostly busting, but uh, you know, with all the COVID nineteen fears and things like that. But especially nineteen twenties, this is going to be really kind of a coordinated effort by uh, kind of rich people for the most part to kind of uh, gain even more money out of the stock market. And again, though, what we're seeing in the nineteen twenties is we'll have more average people buying stocks because of the ability to buy stocks on margin. The other thing that we'll see throughout the 1920s is that um, the stock market, I mean, related to this in the sense that big companies are going to be given tax reductions and that's going to be for wealthy individuals as well. And the 1920s is a really, really good time to be rich, really, really good time to own a big business and things like that. And again, we'll get more into that um, as we continue on, but this is important to acknowledge here as well. Okay, so let me tell you about some other uh, kind of societal, cultural changes occurring throughout the 1920s uh, so you can, you know, f get a little bit more of a glimpse of how things are going to kind of change. Um, this image, by the way, kind of epitomizes a couple different things that are going to happen during the 1920s as far as kind of like social cultural movement. Number one thing that I just kind of want to mention here we're going to continue to see people move into uh, the cities. And so this is a time when really from here on out, more Americans live in the cities than in the countryside. And that will continue to be the trend, but that's something that really hits hard in the 1920s. What we're going to see is kind of more secular opinions. So for as much as we, I talked about fundamentalism in the South. A lot of Americans are going to become more kind of like modernists as far as religious viewpoints. So this is basically this idea that, hey, you know what? Yeah, there's probably God. Yeah, he seems fine. Uh, the Bible is a real book, but we don't necessarily need to, you know, read it literally or something like that. So kind of showing that even though religion will be important in Americans' lives, it will not share that overarching um kind of bearing that it had before in the past. Another thing that definitely is going to be part of the 1920s is going to be a pretty rampant sex culture. Um, sex, always something taboo, but in the 1920s we start to see um, a little bit less of kind of a taboo topic, and we'll even see Margaret Sanger, a big kind of feminist, uh, have a kind of planned birth control meeting uh movement, excuse me, it, it, throughout the United States as she'll push basically uh, for the use of contraceptives. So again, this is not something that's really been common when we're talking about uh, kind of sex and things like that in the United States. On that same topic, women are going to have kind of a woman's rights type movement in the 1920s. And oftentimes this is referred to as the flapper movement. And the reason for that is because of the flapper style, by the way. And I'll show you some pictures of it. But you see it kind of it, with some of these ladies here in the 1920s. And what I'm trying to kind of emphasize here is that women will dress much more provocatively than they had before in the past. You can see here, I mean, they're really still very covered up and all that kind of stuff. But even the fact that they're showing kind of uh, their arms in some cases, um, or they're showing, you know, some thigh and leg is going to be a big change from before. Um, you know, again, before the 1920s, there was kind of this idea that women need to act so proper and all that kind of stuff. Going to kind of move away from that as we hit into the 1920s and women decide to kind of test the boundaries a little bit more. So that includes how they dress. That also include uh, what, what they wear. Uh, that also include them uh, drinking alcohol in public, you know. Um, that also include them smoking cigarettes, you know, things stereotypically that are not considered necessarily ladylike that women will participate in during the 1920s. Blacks, if you recall from last uh, week, are going to continue to move north to pursue opportunities. Again, I want to stress this. Most blacks are still going to be in the south, but some will be up in the north. So that's significant to look at. And when blacks move north, they bring with them their culture and, you know, belief systems and things like that. 
Uh, probably the most uh, amazing literary accomplishment of the period would come with the Harlem Renaissance. A uh, series of books and poems and other types of things uh, in the new kind of black neighborhood of Harlem outside of New York City. And there's kind of a twofold with this. Number one, celebrate black culture. But the other thing is to kind of challenge the existing racism. Okay, and 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 not being content with it, you know, and saying, you know, we got to push a little bit more. Uh, blacks also going to be big in bringing about jazz music, and again, sometimes the 1920s re is referred to as the jazz age, as that will become pretty common and popular music style of um, Americans, and again, it's kind of starting in the South, but also moving to various other places, and then. Um, as far as kind of black activists, if you remember, late 1800s, early 1900s, our big black activists are Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, our kind of black activist of 1920s is going to be a guy by the name of Marcus Garvey from Harlem, or that's where he's going to be at. And he's going to start an organization, the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association. And... A few things that he tries to do, and really what's the big thing, is he tries to institute a um, back-to-Africa movement where Africans are going to move back uh, to Africa in order to try to kind of resettle over there, reroute, and whatever else. Um, it will fail. Okay, That's not going to work. If you remember, they tried to do something similar before. And some of the other initiatives that Garvey tries to initiate are going to fail. But one of the big things that I do want to stress is people like Garvey are going to push stuff like self-reliance for blacks. So this is the idea here that, yeah, you need groceries, you need food. Well, use your money at black restaurants. Use your money at black grocery stores. So that way you're able to make sure that that money is going in the right place. So those are some of the things that we're going to see um, a a as this kind of pushes forward. And again, not a great time for blacks in many respects. The Klan comes back in the 20s. Um, you know, they're exposed to a lot of racism. But the 20s is a time of opportunity, um, especially with so many that are going to start to leave the South and kind of try to explore opportunities in the North. And again, they're exposed to a lot of racism up there, bad working conditions, whatever else, but at least it's something. Okay, I got a lot of pictures here. Um, here, by the way, showing women of the 1920s, also the jazz type part of this. Flapper type uh, style. So again, you can see here kind of much more provocative dress than would have been the case before. She's showing, you know, skin. Also the big uh, kind of necklace. Here's another one. Again, this is kind of showing the uh, smoking of the cigarette. You know, again, uh, this is something that many women did, but not really seen as ladylike to do in public. But that's going to be a, a thing now. Um, here, by the way, are some of our major um, Harlem Renaissance uh, people. And then also include here are people in the, the city of Harlem. So you see some kids and stuff like that. Probably our most famous uh, person of the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes. So he liked this quote, hold fast to dreams, for dreams die. Life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Very powerful. This, by the way, Marcus Garvey, um, from Jamaica originally, and again, pushing this idea of back to Africa. And here we see his United Negro Improvement Association, um, an African American League, and again, you know, the the ambitious project of returning to Africa will not work, but some of the other stuff will work. So, uh, again, the self-reliance, self-help for blacks, that's all good stuff. And here, by the way, Jazz Age, and uh, we see our jazz orchestra, so that's going to be a pretty cool thing, too, as this becomes a popular music style. Okay, so... At this point, uh, in order to kind of take a little break, but also kind of continue with our interactive thing, 
just like you did yesterday, give me one key takeaway um, from the Roaring Twenties from today's lesson. So something that you think is important. Again, it's kind of vague. That's on purpose, but I want that. And then you can move on into the next video, which is the Republican rule of 1920s. There's some more instructions at the end of that of what to do. And as always, thanks. And hopefully you're enjoying this. And as always, any questions, you can either post in the chat or email me or in the Google Classroom, whatever else. Okay, thanks.